Please be seated. I'll ask our jurors again, have you followed my instructions, not talked about the case among yourselves or with anybody else or looked up any of the people or places involved? Even if you did so inadvertently, now would be the time to raise your hand and let me know. For the record, no, no, wit no juror has lifted their hand. Defense. Good morning. You've now heard all the evidence. And essentially, this is what happens when an investigation tries so hard to prove guilt rather than exclude innocence. We're going to talk about how the state failed to meet its burden of proof. And as you've heard from the court, to overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state, the state has the burden of proving the crime with which the defendant is charged, was committed, and the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The court's going to read you that instruction. That's not for me. The defendant is not required to present evidence or prove anything. You're going to hear that reasonable doubt can be found from the evidence, lack of evidence, and conflict of the, in the evidence. And here's the one thing, the one question, no one's answered. Why? Why? Why is Teresa Siebers dead? The best answer we can give you is she is dead because Curtis Wayne Wright killed her. Each one of you said that you can follow the law. And the court is going to instruct you on weighing the evidence. And again, this is an instruction that you're going to get from the court. It's not from me. You're going to take this back with you. And everyone here has agreed to follow the law in this case. And so the judge is going to read you the following instruction when we talk about weighing the evidence and considering witness testimony. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which the witness testified? Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit to get the witness to testify? Had any pressure or threat been used against the witness that affected the truth of the witness's testimony? Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? And finally, has the witness been convicted of a felony? When I spoke to you in jury selection, we talked about how, I don't know if you remember this, we talked about how some some evidence is the, the Walmart evidence, the, the evidence you can pick up, you can look at, you can make an independent evaluation. And other evidence is like the, I think we called it the Home Shopping Network evidence, uh, that basically you kind of hear how good this is, but it's very difficult to make an independent determination as to exactly how worthwhile this evidence is. And so having heard the evidence, you have basically heard the state of Florida try Jimmy Ray Rogers and Curtis Wright instead of Mark Siebers. The state is hoping that by showing, showing you a large volume of evidence about Jimmy and Curtis, that it is going to make it more likely that you just lump Mark in with them and find him guilty. And they used their more credible witnesses in an attempt to lend validity to Mr. Wright. Before I go into the remainder of my closing argument, 
I'm going to address some things that the government said in its closing argument. So one of the things that the government said when discussing principle theory is that someone does not have to be present in the state or at the crime scene when the crime was committed. That applies to Mark. That also applies to Angie Wright. The only evidence, and this is from the state, the only evidence that you actually have of an actual conspiracy came from Curtis Wayne Wright. The only evidence you have of someone promising payment came from Curtis Wayne Wright. Why? They asked, why would Curtis Wayne Wright drive to Florida? Well, he sent texts in advance. I'm going to Florida. He testified. I have to work on the computers. Again, he was an employee of Restorative Health. We talked about a payment advance of $600. And we showed you a, a text that tended to contradict that. It showed $2,000 uh, over 10 months, or $200 a month. And then when we asked Mr. Wright, his answer was, I don't remember. I don't remember. But if you, if you recall, Defendant's Exhibit 3, in Defendant's Exhibit 3, the plea agreement waiver of rights, Mr. Wright is not allowed to forget. Failure of memory is an insufficient reason to allow Mr. Wright to retain his advantageous plea deal. How did they know the, how did they know the codes? Well, first, they were mnemonic devices. 1313 one, three, from the Munsters. And Mr. Wright, don't forget, he had stayed, he had <laughs> stayed at the Seavers residence multiple times in the past. Curtis, how did he know that she would be gone? Well, again, he was coming to Florida to, by his own admission. He said, I have to go to Florida to work on the medical practice computers. He was part of the practice. Did we hear anyone from the, from the practice say that they didn't, that they too didn't know that Teresa would be coming back early? Was this a secret? No. Mr. Wright had been to the Seavers' home on several occasions. We talked about the side door. Why Jimmy the side door that was open? It was supposed to look like a supposed to look like a burglary. Here's here's where the here's where the facade tends to fall apart. So. This was supposed to look like a burglary, but nothing was taken, and we parked too far away to really take anything. There was about $50,000 in cash in the house that could have been set aside. He could have taken it the first time when he came to, to commit the murder, or the second time when he came down for the funeral. So the uh, burner phones, only evidence that they were never used for uh, criminal activity, or they were ever used for criminal activity, was Curtis Wainwright. And yet, interestingly, if we understand the state's evidence, Mr. Seavers and Mr. Wright used their prepaid phones for some unlawful, illicit activity. But Ms. Wright, his wife, and Curtis, that was completely above board. That, those two days when you saw the text message, the victory, the victory text shortly after the murder, 
That was completely for legitimate purposes, but they don't get to have it both ways. When Detective Levitt says that Angie could not have been, could not have been involved in the murder because she wasn't in the state, well, why the double standard? Why, why can she not be involved if she's not in the state but Mark is? Why are Mark's prepaid phones evidence of criminal conspiracy but hers aren't? Oh, and by the way, who tampered with witnesses? Angela Wright. We talked about the recon mission. The recon mission in the back of the Torres residence. That happened in February. I kinda conveniently omitted that date. Ms. Torres says she doesn't like Mark. She's never liked Mark. You saw a select group of texts that the state presented. And they were out of context. If you look at Defendant's Exhibit 2, and you can take it back with you. Defendant's Exhibit 2 begins on January 1st, 2015, and has every text between Curtis Wainwright and Mark Sievers up to July 1st, 2015. <clears throat> Six entire months worth of texts. Interestingly, one of the, one of the texts that the state showed. They showed a text talking about uh, static IP, which is computer stuff. Give me three minutes. Teresa or T is home. Then call on the other. So, if I understand this, we are plotting the murder of a person in, in their presence? That doesn't make sense. Also, I heard Ms. Simmons testify that the prepaid phones, she only got the dates that were requested of her. That was her testimony. She got the dates that were requested of her. We heard the, the text about can't wait for my trip to St. Louis with Josie and Carmen. But Mr. Wright testified that on several occasions, Mark had brought the girls up to St. Louis without Teresa. Teresa was not from St. Louis. Teresa was a busy doctor. Why would Teresa go to, to St. Louis. On June 26th, June 26th, we talked about the, uh, the text. That was also when the Seavers family was flying to New York on vacation. And if you look at the text, if you look at the calls between Mr. Seavers and Mr. Wright, a lot of the calls were friendly. A lot of the calls were business related. A lot of the, the calls, a lot of the texts were about computer, computer things and setting up the VPN. In fact, prior to that, most of those texts, most of those texts were related to establishment of the VPN. And then Curtis got to cherry pick which texts were the illegitimate texts. And remember, Curtis has to tell the truth, and the, tr the truth is determined by the state of Florida. Ms. Danielle Berardelli actually testified that she got a call from Ann Lisa 
to find out about the death of Teresa Sievers. Um, and on June 29th, that was when Mark found out that his wife was murdered. And the state would like you to believe that there is some kind of a protocol, that there is some kind of a, a checklist that you go down when your spouse is murdered, that there is a group of people that you have to call first or at all, that your life is not turned inside out, upside down on its head, that you are not free falling. This is not an emergency. Made a big deal. Does Mark know Jimmy? No. Mark does not know Jimmy. He met Jimmy. He doesn't know Jimmy. They explained, uh, exchanged some pleasantries for a few minutes the day of the wedding. That's not how you know someone. Is there any, any evidence that there was any phone calls between Mark and Jimmy? We did hear, we did hear that there was a photograph of Mark and Taylor and, and, uh, and Jimmy. We heard about this. And again, I go back to the Home Shopping Network evidence versus the Walmart evidence. So we, we heard that there was this, this photograph that I guess was found on the internet and then forwarded to the state. So if I understand this, we required Danielle Berardelli to find a photo of Jimmy, Curtis, and Taylor on the internet. Not the Lee County Sheriff's Office, not the FBI, not any of the, the people who, who worked on this. And by the way, is that photo in evidence? No. Mr. Hunter said that Mr. Wright is a felon and a liar and a killer. Let's not forget Mr. Wright manipulated four of his neighbors into executing false affidavits. Mr. Wright, and we'll go into this more in, in, in mine, is also bipolar. It said no reasonable person should believe him. And then Mr. Hunter started to talk about corroborating facts. And talking about corroborating facts, and at the same time talking about imperfect testimony. And folks, you don't get to have it both ways. You don't get to cherry part pick. You get to, to believe this part. You get to believe this part. You don't have to believe this part, but this part is the honest truth. So the fact that Curtis said, Jimmy used the, the claw part of the hammer that is completely un uncorroborated by Dr. Coyne, the medical examiner, the board certified doctor. But they want you to say, well, okay, maybe, maybe that part's not really credible, but all the parts where they got Curtis to, to follow along with the narrative that Detective Levitt made up, please believe that. Life insurance. How did Curtis Wainwright know about the life insurance? Well, let's go back to January 12th of 2015, where Detective Levitt stands in front of Curtis Wainwright and said, you knew there was life insurance. You were going to get some life insurance money, weren't you? That was the first time, it was the first time we ever heard anything about life insurance. It was January 12th, 2015, from Detective Levitt. And, 
folks, um, you can all take the life insurance policies back there and look at them. Life insurance policies stand, uh, span from being purchased in the year 2000 all the way up to 2009. 2009, when Ms. Lyons did the estate planning for the Seavers family. We talked about the, the jumpsuit, the jumpsuit that was thrown out the window by Ms. Showmaker. And, uh, and that is uh, <clears throat> evidence of a guilty conscience. And she's destroying evidence. Which has exactly what to do with Mr. Sievers. You have the racetrack video, which is again something that corroborates. What does that corroborate? It corroborates that Curtis is guilty, corroborates that Jimmy's guilty. What does that show you about Mr. Sievers? Suited up, two men, two hammers. There is zero forensic evidence of a second hammer. Folks, there's none. There is none. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about why there's none. We went to Walmart to get souvenirs. Is that in indicative of a conspiracy, going to Walmart? Or does that just show that Jimmy and Curtis were here in Florida? We went so far as to talk about Jimmy's shoes and how the soles were black and the soles were white. And that is indicative of a conspiracy how. We talked about the search in the garment. Again, they, they put on a great case with respect to the guilt of Curtis Wainwright and Jimmy Ray Rogers. Does anybody have a reasonable doubt they did it? But how does that corroborate conspiracy with Mark Sievers. Mr. Wright didn't know where Jimmy Ray Rogers was in the house at the time of the murder. The government brought that up. Or we could say he wasn't told where Jimmy Ray Rogers was the night of the murder. Why not tell us about a second hammer? Or why tell us about a second hammer? Well, to get the answer to that, we have to go to January 12th, 2016, in the proffer agreement. The proffer agreement, first, Mr. Wright says, I wasn't even in the house. I don't know what happened. Jimmy, Jimmy did this. And the state said, we don't believe you. And then, okay, I was in the house, but I was in a different room. And once again, it was, that's no good. And then, third time being a charm. Okay. I struck her with a hammer three times, and then Jimmy had a different hammer and just did the same thing. Okay, good enough. And we spoke, Mr. Hunter spoke about, does it matter if the claw part of the hammer was used or not? And this is after you've seen evidence of Walmart, you've seen evidence of uh, prepaid phones, you've seen videos from CVS, you've seen videos from Racetrack, you've, uh, you've seen 
uh, data locations for the Garmin's, you've seen geolocations for phones. You heard for 90 minutes about how a white Hyundai went from Arizona to Florida. But it doesn't matter what, how the hammer was used. And then we get to how Mr. Sievers was acting. And the witnesses who told you about all the suspicious activity, all the <coughs> odd things that Mr. Sievers was doing, they all had one thing in common. And that is, they all came forward at the last moment. All of their testimony first popped up about this late 2019, a couple months ago. Danielle Berardelli said that Mr. Uh, Mr. Sievers went to her and said he, he was afraid of her arrest, but she gave a statement to the police on July 1st of 2015. Never told them that. And then Mr. Mr. Seaver's behavior of spending a lot of money on life insurance policy. Let's think about that. Let's think about the life insurance. They went in 2009 to see a board certified attorney. And she said, you are underinsured. You need more insurance. And this wasn't just for the death benefits. This is for asset protection. This is for estate uh, tax. This is for business growth. And she drafted a trust. And so, don't forget too, Mr. Sievers had a $2.5 million policy out on himself that is exactly the same as Teresa's 2.5 policy. And the other one was back from 2000, 2001, when she was still married to Mr. Cousins. So why be so concerned about arrest? It's consciousness of guilt. No, it's consciousness of accusation. It is consciousness of accusation. Each and every one of us knows what it feels like to be accused of something. Objection, Your Honor. heard that Dr. Petrida said, Teresa's hurt, you need to get back here. And we've seen all the text logs, all the phone call logs from Mark Sievers' phone are in evidence, including the call log from the day of the murder. Did, did anybody hear about what calls Mr. Seavers got when he found out that his wife was murdered? Did you hear anything about that? We heard a, about the, the voicemail to Dr. Petritus. It was odd. It was unusual. Well, it was unusual because prior to then, Dr. Petritus had never dropped his wife off at law school in Indiana and had to come back home to, to an empty house. It absolutely was unusual. And he told you it was, it was an emotional day. He was upset.
Why did Scott Sievers deliver the news? Why was Scott the, the bearer of bad news, Mr. Sievers' brother? And again, what is the proper protocol? What is the correct way to handle your spouse being brutally murdered? Mr. Hunter said, why what wouldn't Miss Lyons give straight answers? Maybe she has an interest in the way this case turns out. First, maybe, maybe does not get you anywhere near beyond into the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. And folks, if you want to know who has an interest in this case, turn your heads to the right. Or maybe, maybe it was because Miss Ross ins insisted that the irrevocable life insurance trust was a marital trust. And our board certified attorney and Will's trust in the state says no, they're different things. A marital trust is different than an irrevocable life insurance trust. So now I'm going to go back to what I was going to tell you. And I'm going to talk to you now about the witnesses we heard from in no particular order. We heard from Taylor Showmaker. She has received $20,000 to testify and help the police. She said that she knew about the potential for $55,000 more from Crime Stoppers. She was threatened by the police. She was worried they were going to take her children. She saw a ball peen hammer in the cooler, not a claw hammer. Is that cooler ever tested for serology or forensic evidence? She helped the police find the jumpsuit used in the crime. A jumpsuit that had no blood on it. And there was no evidence that ties the scene and the vehicle to the jumpsuit. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Okay. The jumpsuits, the coveralls, were what they, they called the originating uh, garment or the origin. So the fibers were going away from the jumpsuit. The fibers were going from the jumpsuit to Teresa Sievers, from the jumpsuit to the vehicle. But there was no cross transfer. There was blood spatter 36 inches up. There was no blood spatter. There was no reciprocal fibers from the interior of the vehicle on the jumpsuit. So we have a complete unilateral donation of evidence without any reciprocation. And isn't it interesting that uh, Nick Schooneman from Missouri sat right up there and said his job was to accompany the Lee County Sheriff's Office while they were up there to collect evidence. This is the, the, same, the same man who was visibly agitated when it was merely suggested that he keep the same gloves on. This individual showed that, that much attention to detail. He was that conscientious 
about how he handled the evidence even here at trial. And he was nowhere to be found when that jumpsuit was recovered. Likewise, he was nowhere to be found when Taylor Showmaker led Detective Downs to a cell phone cover. And we heard testimony that <clears throat> that cell phone cover went to an identical cell phone that was found in, in the bathroom. Objection to the statement of the evidence. Overruled, the jury will rely on their own memory of the evidence. And so, essentially, the, the evidence that we have is that Ms. Showmaker leads the tenant downs to a jumpsuit. And then less than 24 hours later, leads him to a, to a cell phone cover. She said that Jimmy threw out the shoes in the dumpster. But only with the assistance of Taylor Showmaker was he able to to discard a jumpsuit by the side of the road. And how does any of that make Mark guilty? We heard Dr. Mark Petritus statements about Mark expressing a disbelief about Curtis. This was someone Mark trusted. Who on earth would suspect a friend would do something this horrific, this violent? Again, this is, there is nothing, there is nothing that can prepare an individual for a life event like this. We heard statements about Mark wanting Curtis to continue working on restorative health computers from the jail, but we didn't hear anyone come in from the jail to offer any evidence that, yes, Mr. Severs had contacted the jail and, um, and, asked, and asked that um, he continue to do this. Mr. Petri Dr. Petritus, again, reserved these statements until September of 2019. And if, if I recall, Mr. Hunter asked Dr. Petritus, are you familiar with the rules of criminal procedure? Do you believe you have to be familiar with the rules of criminal procedure to give timely information to the police after your friend is murdered? Does that requ require a law degree? And by the way, Mr. Petritus, or Dr. Petritus, may not be familiar with the rules of criminal procedure, but his wife is. Dr. Petritus testified that he lives and works very close to Jarvis. Mark was aware that Dr. Petritus' wife was starting law school and would be returning to Florida. And in fact, in the voicemail, voicemail starts, it says, I just talked to Michelle and she said you're home. Again, that was a, that was a big event for the Petritus family. And speaking of was the witness straightforward, was Dr. Petritus in any hurry 
to disclose the area of law in which his wife practiced? Or did he say, is that really necessary? Opting to say, she works for the state instead of she drafts appeals in capital cases. Dr. Petritus testified that he did not have a close relationship with Mark Sievers except for the fact that Mark Sievers had keys to his house. And as close as Dr. Petritus was to Teresa Sievers, and perhaps or perhaps not to Mark Sievers, no testimony of marital turmoil or financial strife. Also, Dr. Petritus has known Mark Sievers to carry more than one phone. Dr. Petritus sat through the entire Jimmy Ray Rogers trial watching the evidence. And Teresa, Teresa trusted Dr. Petritus enough to call him to come check on her when Mark was away. We heard from Detective Levitt, who is now Lieutenant Levitt. He got a promotion. He came up with a theory of life insurance, and he told you, I came up with a theory, but I don't really have any evidence that this is what it's for. It was just a theory. Or I think he called it a theme. And he devised the blueprint for the narrative that you heard. It just so happens that the things he talked about were the very same things that Curtis Wainwright would adopt a few weeks later. He testified Curtis Wainwright was never administered a polygraph. He said he can't say how many hammers were used. He said if Teresa left to move away, as he suggested, Mark could have and would have followed her. And he excluded Angie Wright as a witness because she wasn't in the state of Florida when Teresa was murdered, just like Mr. Sievers. And again, Angie Wright had a prepaid phone from June 28th and June 29th. Angie Wright was not in the state of Florida when the murder happened. Mark Sievers was. Angie got a text almost immediately following the murder. Angie tampered with witnesses. But here we are, state of Florida versus Mark Sievers. Detective Downs went with Taylor to discover evidence, paid Taylor approximately $20,000, executed a search warrant of the Seavers condominium that revealed that Mark flew to St. Louis, that Mark and Curtis had correspondence in 2002, and that Mark owned the condominium. And if the police didn't know that Mark owned the condominium, how did they know to search it? He was also promoted to lieutenant. Is there anything, is there anything that Detective Downs told you that furthers the conspiracy? Nope. Adam Hughes was the paramedic from Fire Rescue, said Dr. Petritus was very flustered and had difficulty answering questions. Ann Lisa testified that she and Teresa were very close. I believe the word she used was soulmates. We heard no testimony about money, infidelity, marital turmoil. Detective Nolan started this case as the lead investigator. 
gathered evidence, observed no cast-off at the crime scene, did not disturb or touch anything in the house, did not know what the medical legal meant until he later was uncovered that he took a medical legal course, and again, failed to present anything that would tend to make Mark Seavers guilty. We heard from Jerry Lubinsky, uh, Curtis's neighbor and friend from Missouri. Mr. Lubinsky said he never spoke with Mark about coin values, directly contradicting what Curtis had said. Curtis said, no, I was there. I was there and it happened. Yeah. Your Honor, uh, I think the rules of judicial administration require the use of last names of witnesses. Mr. Wright, Mr. Wright said, I never spoke, or Mr. Wright said, I was there when Mr. Lubinsky and Mark Seavers spoke about coin values. That's a direct contradiction. Mr. Lubinsky only ever spoke with Mr. Seavers at the Wright wedding. Mr. Wright built a deck in 2012 using the same hurt shoulder, using the same arm that he used to strike Teresa Seavers. Mr. Lubinsky testified that Curtis has short-term memory problems. Is there anything about Mr. Lubinsky's testimony that makes Mr. Seavers more guilty. We heard from CST Kimberly Van Wass, who was extremely detail-oriented. She took thousands, thousands of photographs of the crime scene. Kimberly Van Wass, in her report, said, crime scene was unusual because there was no cast off. There was only one, <coughs> one hammer that was presented and placed into evidence. Ms. Van Wass testified that it did not appear to be a theft-like burglary, that there was nothing taken, that there was just under $50,000 in cash left in the home, that there was no biological evidence found around the motorcycle. And the significance of that, if you recall, Mr. Wright, in his testimony, said that he was admiring Mr. Seaver's motorcycle in the dark in his taped up coveralls in June, in summer, in an unair conditioned garage in Florida. There was no blood found by the side door. There was no blood found on the side by the side door of the garage, where Mr. Wright testified that he and Mr. Rogers removed their jumpsuits and packaged them back in the backpack. She testified that the, the dog bowl was found in the doorway. And Madam Clerk, can I see the defendant's So testified about this dog bowl. This dog bowl we see here again that was kicked and Mr. Mr. Wright testified if we look at it this way that he would have been going from as I'm orienting this photograph right now from the right side of the photograph to the left side. He kicked the dog bowl 
The dog bowl went forward. Well, in order for the dog bowl to have come back into the door frame, that dog bowl would have had to have stopped and reversed on its own. I asked every witness who went into that house, every single one of them, did you touch anything? Did you move the dog bowl? We heard blood by the refrigerator went up about 36 inches. And we saw that the blood was spattered out enough, enough to cover the entire refrigerator. But where was the blood on the recovered overalls or coveralls? We heard evidence and the state statement's closing or opening statement said that it was going to show you a shredded life insurance policy. And that shredded life insurance policy was going to be evidence of guilt. And then as it turned out, that shredded life insurance policy was a blank disability policy mailer. And as the, as the state told you in its opening statement that they're going to show you how this shredded document is somehow indicative of Mr. Seaver's guilt, never mind we have no, in, no evidence about who actually shredded the, the policy, we can reasonably expect that after I sit down, the state's going to get up here and they're going to explain how this life insurance policy that's not a life insurance policy, that's a disability policy, is somehow, is somehow indicative of Mr. Seaver's guilt. Ms. Van Watts uh, said there were no, no matches from the door frame to the pry bar testified there was um, no blood results from the jumpsuit. And I'm going to, I'm going to address uh, the DNA and the, and the fiber evidence a little later when, uh, when I speak about um, Mrs. Uh, Fentress uh, and Ms. Uh, Otterstep. This man was did an excellent job of gathering evidence. But it doesn't link Mark Sievers to anything. I'm going to talk to you now about Myra Simmons. She was the Selhawk uh, phone analyst who was recently retired. She discovered the existence of the prepaid phones, including... Angie writes, and she showed you the overlay, and you remember seeing the overlay, the overlay being the red dots with the blue dots inside them. And when we look at the overlay, we see the red dots, we see the blue dots, we do not see times, and we do not see dates. And so what we have is an incomplete picture. Because many, and go ahead and look, go ahead and look at the prepaid phone, many of those prepaid phones would have been after hours. Would have been when Mr. Seavers and Dr. Seavers were home. But we don't have any evidence of where Teresa Seavers were. Because nobody thought to, to maybe put her also on that map in a different color. So we could see if Dr. Seavers was in the same location or a different location in the same place at the same time. Now they did, however, 
had the technology to show you where she was on the night of the murder. So it's not that they didn't have the ability. They made a choice not to. We see an overlap of the blue dots and the red dots north of the Seavers residence. And when I asked, is that where restorative health is? Is that where the medical practice is? I don't know. Well, if a prepaid phone call is being made during business hours at a medical practice where their staff where Dr. Seavers works, that's significant. That's important. Mr. Seavers' prepaid phone, according to this document, was used for a grand total of approximately one hour. And in less than 15 minute increments. And don't forget, there was a month gap. There was a month gap in phone usage. <clears throat> Linda Ottestatter from the FBI. She was the FBI trace examiner, uh, the physical scientist. Uh, she found fibers from the coverall on Teresa, but she testified that there was no cross-transfer. And when I asked her about weathering, remember weathering, we talked about did, did this look like something that was exposed to the elements? And interestingly enough, we've got the coveralls that were covered from the side of the road and the two coveralls that were donated from the dough run plant. Do they look any different as far as the color? Do they look any different? I mean, yes, the, the one had been hit with a lawnmower, and we can see that on the photos the state presented that um, that coverall was laying on top of uh, what appeared to be freshly cut grass. But does it look weathered? Does it look like it had been exposed to the elements for any amount of time? And again, like Mr. Hunter said, you can bring it back with you. Bring it back with you. Lay them all out side by side. And then make your own independent analysis. Make your own determination as to whether these coveralls had been at the side of the road for a month. Did we hear any evidence that the, the break and the cuffs of the coveralls. If there was any duct tape residue. Do we hear any evidence of that? How does any of that make Mr. Seavers guilty? Well, when Miss Otterstatter was done, she said, I recovered a hair. I recovered a hair. And so she sent the hair for analysis to Cherie Fentress. She was the FBI uh, analyst for mitochondrial DNA. And she said that the tiny little hair matched Jimmy Ray Rogers. She also said she can't tell when or where it was transferred. Can't tell you how long the hair was on the coveralls where the transfer was made. So you cannot assume that the only time, the only place this transfer could have been made was during the murder. Because remember, Jimmy wore coveralls every day to work. He wore them every day. So we could reasonably expect that there is going to be a hair transfer every time you put on an article of clothing. We spoke to Ms., uh, Mr. Nick Schuneman from Missouri. 
And I'm sure you all remember, we saw a photograph of various knives and hammers sitting next to Jimmy Ray Rogers' bedside. They were collected. Were, were any of those physical items ever offered into evidence? Do we have any type of forensic analysis? <coughs> or is this just something maybe made to look worse than it really was? We saw the black backpack that went from Florida and came back the North Face uh, backpack that y'all saw. It had the jumpsuits in it, but it had no trace evidence. It had no blood. There was nothing, there was nothing connecting this black backpack to the crime scene. And keep in mind, that black backpack had gone from Missouri to Florida to Missouri. And they recovered nothing. Meanwhile, a white Hyundai Elantra went from Missouri to Florida back to Missouri, then apparently went to Arizona. And they were able to recover trace fibers out of that vehicle. Backpack again was devoid of any serology, DNA, or trace evidence. We heard from Monica Lyons. Monica Lyons, who is a board certified Wills Trust and a state's attorney, and the Florida Bar has declared her an expert in that field. You heard her testify that if you are not a board certified attorney, and you purport to be an expert in a given area of law, you can be sanctioned. The Florida, the Florida bar will come down with, will come down on you. You know, I'm object facts not in evidence. She sat there and said she assumed so. Overruled. The jury will rely on their own memory of the testimony. Miss Lyons drafted the <coughs> irrevocable life insurance trust for Teresa Sievers and for Mark Sievers in 2008-2009. They each had essentially identical trusts. She said the Sievers were underinsured with respect to life insurance. They were underinsured. She anticipated that restorative health would grow and they were preparing accordingly. She testified Mark has a reciprocal 2.5 policy 2.5 million, that is. And, uh, and again, uh, Mark had the identical um, irrevocable life insurance trust. She testified that the policies dated back all the way from 2000, 2001, all the way up to 2009. And if I understand the state's position, um, that the, the trust, even though they were identical trusts, uh, from the state's questioning, uh, I, I guess that the, the this board certified trust attorney who uh, drafted these these eyelets, um, I guess there's is there some inference that it was d being done for some nefarious purpose back in 2008 2009. The policies were not just life insurance to provide money upon death. They were used as a tax buffer. They were used for asset protection. They were used for business growth planning. And in fact, what we heard is one of the policies wasn't actually even a life insurance policy. It was an IRA, an individual retirement annuity, which means that its growth is largely contingent upon the contributions of the intended recipient. What you put in, you get out. It's supposed to grow, um, but the, the growth is according to, to how the uh, IRA spreads out its investments. There are significant penalties for taking distributions from an IRA before a certain age. And that age is 55. So Mark, Mr. Sievers, is ineligible to take a distribution 
without incurring that penalty. Objection. Facts not in evidence. Misstatement of the law. We heard from various other witnesses. We had several witnesses who put in a Walmart video that show Curtis Wainwright and Jimmy Ray Rogers going through Walmart. We heard approximately 90 minutes of testimony about how a rental car got from Arizona to Florida. Uh, we also, during that time, heard about a two and a half hour line search that yielded no evidence. We heard the decontamination procedure at a Missouri recycling uh, plant. We saw a video from Circle K DVR. We saw a race, a race uh, track uh, video DVR. None of that, none of that proves that Mr. Seavers is guilty. We heard from Ms. Uh, Bokoffer. She was the lady with the maps. And uh, if you, if you look at the story the map tells, and you look at the story Mr. Mr. Curtis Wainwright tells, you'll notice that in the afternoon of the 28th, there's a six-hour stop near Colonial by I-75. Mr. Wright never testified to that. Maps don't even show where Mr. Wright purportedly stopped to dispose of evidence at some rest stop. The maps do, however, show that Curtis, Jim, Curtis Wayne Wright and Jimmy Ray Rogers were headed back up to Missouri when Angela Wright would have gotten her victory text. How does any of that make Mark Seavers guilty? We heard from two of Teresa's friends. One was Dr. Beth Mitchell, who came forward after someone told her that that person was communicating with Teresa presently from, from beyond the grave. I don't think you were supposed to find out about that, but she didn't, she didn't actually come forward until somebody said, I'm, I've, been, I've been speaking, I've been communicating with Teresa Seavers in 2019. And she is a doctor in the Hillsborough County Jail. Interestingly, she refused to give the name of the friend having communication with Teresa. She did say that Mark and Teresa could confide in her, but provided no testimony of marital turmoil or financial strife. We heard from Danielle Berardelli, who apparently has an email with a photograph of Jimmy uh, Ray Rogers, Mark Seavers, and Taylor Showmaker that you never saw. And Miss Berardelli was another, another person who didn't come forward until 2019. And if this investigation left no stone unturned, as the, as the government told you in its opening, wouldn't you expect to see this photo? Yeah, this is a textbook <coughs> example of how you are supposed to weigh the evidence and judge witness credibility. She said that Mark and Teresa could confide in her. There was no testimony of marital turmoil or financial strife. And Dr. Petritus, Danielle Berdinelli, and uh, Dr. Mitchell, they all said that Mark was supposed to feel differently, that Mark was not feeling the right way after learning that his friend had been arrested. He was feeling the wrong feelings. But what did he know? And if their inference, if their inference was that an accusation is proof positive of guilt, if that's the inference, 
And Mark is accused. When we use the transitive theory, Mark must be guilty because he's accused. It's interesting. They came forward in 2019. In 2019, we know a lot more about this case than we did in 2015. 2016. In fact, I'm not going to go into the details, but we've had an entire jury trial on Mr. Jimmy Ray Rogers. Some of them have died. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. We can't look at what happened in 2015 and 2016 as if we knew then what we know now. And why would Mark suspect his friend? This is his friend who sent him a comforting text. Scott told me what happened. I'm so sorry. This is his friend who came down and comforted him and the family at the funeral who installed the security system in, in the house. Someone who appeared, who they thought of as a friend. And little did Mr. Seavers know that he was just a wolf in sheep's clothing. When asked, none of these people <coughs> could tell you how Mr. Seavers should have felt or what the right thing to do was. We heard from Ms. Torres, who's given about, to date, eight, probably more by today, um, stories to media outlets regarding Mark. We heard about one, agree uh, one argument. In the six years they were married, we heard about one argument. And interestingly, when Detective Nolan first got a statement from her, she never mentioned that. In fact, she didn't mention that argument until she spoke with Gulf Shore Life magazine. She doesn't like Mark Seavers. She told you that. And after hearing Teresa say, I'm leaving, she never actually saw Teresa get in her car and leave. We hear from Dr. Coyne, who is our medical examiner. Dr. Coyne testified that Teresa was struck with a hammer approximately 17 times. He testified that the claw part of the hammer was never used. This was not, this was not a ball peen hammer. Hammers are weapons of opportunity. He said that there, there would have been blood spatter and, and So let's look at the life insurance. Now, I've, I've talked to you about all the witnesses kind of in isolation that I want to. I want to talk, start talking about life insurance. Having a life insurance policy does not mean that you are guilty of anything. Going to an estate planning attorney does not mean that you are guilty of anything. And let's not forget, the estate planning happened in 2008-2009. The murder happened in 2015. The estate planning was reciprocal. Mark and Teresa both had life insurance trusts. Mark and Teresa had $2.5 million policies. The mere existence of life insurance does not prove motive. So now we get to Curtis Wainwright. Let's talk about Mr. Wright. On July 12, 2015, Curtis told Detective Levitt 
not once but twice. I never left Missouri. He repeated that same story, August 27th, 2015. I never left Missouri. Curtis told Detective Levitt that he has a traumatic brain injury resulting in bipolar, memory issues, and aggression. So I'm going to stop right, right there. When Curtis Wayne Wright tells Detective Levitt twice on July 12, 2015, that he never left Missouri, I'm going to circle way back to what we talked about earlier. And that is the instructions that the court is going to read you and weighing the evidence. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he gave in court? He said he never left Missouri, August 27, 2015. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he gave in court? The traumatic brain injury resulting in bipolar memory issues and aggression. Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? So we move ahead to the January 16, 2016 proffer. That was when Mr. Wright said, I was not inside the home when the murder occurred. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he gave in court? Then he said he was inside a different room when Jimmy was striking Teresa. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he gave in court? Finally, the third time, after being told twice, he relayed a story where he struck Teresa three times with a hammer. Has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? He said he struck Teresa three times, but Jimmy was swinging the hammer wildly and used the claw portion of the hammer, and yet there was no cast off. Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in this case? Stopped at the rest stop just north of Lee County to dispose of evidence. Look at the maps. Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in this case? He told you he manipulated four people into providing false affidavits. Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he gave in court? In this case, no. He got other people to do it for him. <clears throat> Stated Jimmy used the, the claw part of the hammer contrary to the testimony of Dr. Coyne. Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? He kicked the dog bowl forward, but it went from the resting place in the corner backwards, thereby defying the laws of physics. Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? You've seen the photograph. It was the dog bowl that alerted Teresa Sievers. It was not the sounds of footsteps of a large man walking toward her. It was not the sound that friction makes when a hammer is removed from a hard surface such as a standing refrigerator or a freezer. You have to believe that Mr. Wright was looking at the motorcycle in an unair conditioned garage in June and summer in Florida while wearing a taped up jumpsuit. And I want to talk to you about something we talked about in jury selection. And one of the things that we talked about is, is a conviction, a just conviction, if it happens but it's a mistake and we just, we just don't have the scientific 
tools are just not around yet. In this case, we do. It's called a polygraph. And Mr. Wright never took one. Objection, Your Honor. Improper argument. You saw, or you, you can see in the agreement, Mr. Wright must subject himself to a polygraph upon request and failure, failure to pass a polygraph removes the deal. Removes his 25 years, removes the second degree murder. Basically, if he doesn't pass that polygraph, he sits where Mark Seaver sits. So why not do it? Well, if you're like me, probably had some Thanksgiving dinner last week. Yeah, I'm going to have an improper argument. Sustained. So it, uh, I'll rephrase. When you have Thanksgiving dinner, and you've eaten all the turkey and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes. Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is an improper argument. What's that, the crook? Let me know when you're ready. Okay. Ready. Okay. So law enforcement never requested that Mr. Seavers, or Mr. Curtis Wainwright, submit to a polygraph. And as I was saying before, it's a lot like Thanksgiving dinner, when you've had all the stuffing and the gravy and the mashed potatoes and the pumpkin pie. Do you go right afterwards and get on the scale? Of course not, because you already know what it's going to say. And without Mr. Wright, without Mr. Wright, there is no case. You each have to believe Mr. Wright's story about this conspiracy. You must each believe it hook, line, and sinker, beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt, because he is the only witness who gave any evidence of a conspiracy. We'll never know why Teresa Sievers was murdered, because Curtis, won't, Curtis Wainwright won't tell us. You heard Curtis agree with every beat of the state's narrative that was constructed on July 12, 2015. Curtis said that he recommended counseling or, uh, or divorce, but couldn't really give you any concrete details about what was going on in the marriage. And there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no texts there's nothing to support that they had this, this relationship. Curtis said that Mark, Mark told them that they were on the, the cusp of bankruptcy. There's no evidence to support that. Curtis could have taken $50,000 that was in, inside the home. It could have been set aside in a secret place and taken away. Or when Curtis came back to the funeral, it could have been given then and that didn't happen. Curtis committed a murder with a hammer in a house that was full of knives and guns. And so it's interesting <coughs> that what Curtis says, he got the garage code, the door code for Mr. Sievers. 
he could have just as easily gotten the code to the safe and used the gun. Mr. Wright testified that he was going to do the rear naked choke on Dr. Sievers. He was going to creep up from behind her, put one arm around her throat, another arm behind her head, and squeeze. But he kicked the dog ball, and so he had to use the hammer that was already in his hand the same hammer that would have made the rear naked choke impossible. He parked in an apartment complex that was too far away to take things, to make it look like a burglary. He testified the wet wipes for, for the cleanup. Why get wet wipes for a cleanup if you don't anticipate any blood? Why pry the side door and not take anything? And when asked, Mr. Wright was upset that it wasn't better prepared. His regret was not that it had happened. There's no remorse for that. It was just that he could have planned it better. Mark is still preparing a virtual private network and business computers only to murder the practice's only doctor? Does that make any sense? And Curtis's story started out, there was no money agreed upon in the initial proffer, but that was later corrected. We can't forget Curtis had access to the Seavers computers. He had that backdoor VPN. He's a five-time convicted felon with a traumatic, traumatic brain injury. It causes anger and memory issues. and the crime scene itself. Those photos, they're hard to look at. And they're hard to look at because that, that crime scene is anger and it's violence and it's rage and it's hate. It is not murder for money. I think we've already discussed how his wife had a prepaid phone on June 28th and June 29th only, how she got the victory text, how she tampered with witnesses, and why not prosecute Angie? Because she's a blip. She's a blip that only Curtis Wainwright can make go away. Did they have enough evidence to prosecute Angie? Or would that require Curtis to testify against his wife? You've heard now all the inconsistencies with the murder the lies, Jerry uh, Lubinsky saying he and Mr. Sievers never spoke about coin values, um, contrary to what Mr. Wright said. Mr. Wright will tell you anything except that he regrets it. The state pulled out select text messages between Mr. Wright and Mr. Sievers. And let's think about the prepaid phones. Prepaid phones are effective in one of three situations. One would be if there is no known communication between the parties, this would keep communication secure. Two, if the parties are uh, concerned of being recorded, 
and three, if the prepaid phones would be used to send text messages. Defendants Exhibit 2 is all the text messages between Mr. Severs and Mr. Wright from January 1st all the way to July 1st of 2015. Please view them. Please look at the maps. Consider exactly how callous this was. Curtis and Jimmy went to Walmart, went to the beach, had a couple beers before going to murder a friend's wife. We they skipped over the six or so hours they spent at the corner of Colonial in 75. Um, but you'll see around 1130, that's when they start to make their way back up, up north again. <clears throat> and maybe, just maybe, take a look at the racetrack and the shell, uh, or the shell or circle K, uh, the video where you see what Mr. Wright is out doing by the car, how he's cleaning the car. It's not a very good video, but it does look like he makes several trips to a trash can. <coughs> Keep in mind, one of Mr. Wright's obligations under the contract that he has with the state is that he has to lead the state to additional evidence. Mr. Wright told you that he was planning to come to Southwest Florida to work on the Seavers business computers upgrades. That's why he told everyone that he was going to Florida. Maybe if he was planning to murder Dr. Seavers, he should not have told everyone he was going to Florida. Maybe he just didn't know he was going to murder her at the time. Mr. Wright has knowledge and experience with cell phones, geolocations, electronic uh, digital footprints, but yet he allowed his, uh, his partner in crime, Mr. Rogers, to bring a phone with him and plug that phone into the garment and enter in addresses. Curtis is still the only one only person who took the witness stand and said Mark did it. And so the state made a deal with the devil and now Objection it is your, your improper argument. Now it is your unenviable task to decide what witnesses are motivated by money or preferential treatment. Which witnesses are dishonest or motivated by a favorable plea deal? Who's looking for their 15 minutes of fame? And who can't be trusted? So here we are. Here we are. We have now talked about all the witnesses. And we're no closer to answering the question, why, than we were when this trial started. Curtis said the children were in danger. The children were in danger. In danger of what? In danger from where? Was Dr. Seavers the danger? And if so, how? 
July 12th, Cur Curtis was first presented by Detective Levitt that this was something for life insurance. On July 12th, Curtis was first presented that this was something that was because of a failing marriage. Teresa was going to move away and take the, take the kids, uh, and, the, and the Seavers were on the cusp of bankruptcy. And Mr. Hunter talked about evidence that corroborates. But you never got details. You never got any of that out from Curtis. Were there any details to give? Where was Teresa moving? What type of danger were the children in? How dire was their financial status? He told you. He counseled Mark to reconcile, spent time talking with Mark about his problems, but couldn't give you any details. And if the Seavers were in financial trouble, the state has presented evidence that they've subpoenaed airline purchases, life insurance policies. They, um, they, they showed you uh, evidence from, from, from Walmart, evidence from Circle K. They, they spared no expense, but they couldn't get bank records? The state presented life insurance policy, but failed to present any witness to contextualize them and make them a motive, except for Curtis. And look at Exhibit 25A that the state presented versus Defendant's Exhibit 2. Look at the shredded life insurance policy that was actually a MetLife disability mailer. Look at the incomplete burner phone evidence and how Angie 702 was conveniently omitted. Look at how Ann Lisa, Dr. Beth Mitchell, Danielle Bertarelli, and Dr. Mark Petritus, all of whom had close confidential relationships with Teresa, with whom they confided and she would confide. Who said there was a problem? And the states tried to sanitize the testimony of Mr. Wright to make it palatable. The five-time bipolar convicted felon who lied repeatedly, murdered Dr. Seavers, and manipulated, manipulated his neighbors and only came clean after given the choice to cooperate or sit where Mark sits. It is the job of the state prove guilt beyond every reasonable doubt. And when I spoke to you a couple weeks ago, I think I talked to you about how reasonable doubt, I told you the analogy of the, the box and the cat and the mouse, and so if there's a hole in the box, then wouldn't you have a reasonable doubt that the cat ate the mouse? shredded life insurance policy that wasn't a life insurance policy that's merely intended to make an innocent person look guilty? Is that the hole in the box? The last minute witnesses who came forward, one of whom because a friend was communicating with uh, Dr. Seavers from beyond the grave, is that the hole in the box? The coveralls that are devoid of any blood, is that the hole in the box? The dog bowl that defied the laws of physics, the rear naked choke from a trained fighter who's holding an object that prevents him from doing that same move. The lack of geolocation from Dr. Teresa Seaver's phone other than the night of the murder. Angie's two-day prepaid phone was for legitimate purposes with a text within minutes of the murder. And Angie given a pass because she was not in the state of Florida. a life insurance trust and life insurance from 2000 to 2009 as a motive with nothing else? No cash set aside to take during the murder with $50,000 in the house? No cash conveyed when Mr. Mr. Wright came, came back for the funeral several days later? The stage burglary 
where nothing was taken, looking at a motorcycle in the dark? That's reasonable doubt. That's all reasonable doubt. When you weigh the evidence and you look at all these facts, ultimately, the one question you all have to ask yourselves, do you trust Curtis Wainwright? And would you feel different if a polygraph had been administered? Mark Sievers is innocent, and accordingly, you should return a verdict of not guilty for one count of first-degree murder and not guilty for one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Thank you. Before going to the final stretch of closings, is there any juror that needs to use the restroom? Okay, I see several hands. I'm going to instruct you again not to talk about the case among yourselves or with anybody else or look up any of the people or places involved. I'll be with you momentarily.